life now. Okay, thanks. Um, so, um, public accountability meeting on the 23rd of Jan. Um, we have got apologies from ACC Oliver, John McFaul, and Rob Bowles. Um, so, if we can go on to the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, thanks. Um, so, if the minutes of the previous meeting, um, does anybody have any comments or anything they'd like to raise that is not on the agenda? Page one. Page two. Page three. So uh, if we then go on to the action log. So the first action 213 uh, is about the uh, modern slavery report. Um, so, so we have to press no. no. Okay. Um, yes, so that report um, is just about finalised and will be with your consult by the end of the week. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So we will then have a look at it um, and uh, bring up any issues through G or something like that. I think so. it would probably be worth uh, having it as a paper that's published for the next yes. meeting so that the public can see it as well. Yes, and yes. We don't need to discuss it then. So. Yeah. Okay, uh, next one is um, 214. Uh, which is which is fine, uh, which is the um, knowledge about around the rural task force in the control room. It might be able to have a slightly more specific update. So it sort of says they're still trying, but, but I think it's what it says. Well, it basically says there isn't any space in the induction programme. And Inspector Grange will continue to develop this matter. So I think what we need will be an update as to how he's developing that. We definitely have had awareness inputs from the team previously as to whether or not they can get into their formal training structure. So they are aware of the reason why the task force is there, <coughs> and also it links into process change around wildlife crime investigation, tapping into the right people. I think they just struggled to get into the induction yeah. program. So I think if John can just feed back as to how he's how they're making yeah that's fine <coughs> um then um two and five uh that's been done um and um there is the, I, I believe there's a paper gone into the community fund um uh for them yes um uh, obviously Kirby Visperton is on the agenda um, and that's it okay um so we now come on to um, the questions from the pub public. Um, so we have um, received um, a lot of questions from the public, which is excellent. Um, so what I propose to do, because some of them have got quite long answers, um, so what I propose to do is the ones that are uh, um, related to the operation at Kirby Misperton, we cover off in the Kirby Misperton item that is on the agenda. Um, and in addition to that, we will publish written answers to these questions specifically following this, this meeting. Um, there is just one that I thought I needed to uh, comment on, which is the first one, which is around uh, the, the paying for the um, uh, policing resources uh, at the site. Um, and the suggestion in particular that Third Energy themselves should pay for it. Um, I, I, I can understand that why that might be quite an attractive proposal, but the issue I would have there is that it could then be um, alleged that the police would be beholden to Third Energy because Third Energy were paying for the policing operation. So I think that creates a conflict of of interest, so um, so they they can't pay for it at the moment, and nor do I think they should pay for it. Whether or not the government might like to consider um, a sort of um, a contribution nationally from private companies that involve uh, that require whose activities require policing activities, and do through some other way that that isn't 
directly related to the operation, that might be a way of doing it, but there's no provision for that at the moment. So, so I, don't, I don't think it would be right for Third Energy to pay for the policing costs. Just for the benefit of the public, there is something called Special Policing Services, and it's a document that's readily available in the public domain, which is where the police service, so for example, football matches, um, there's a lot of case law in relation to what the police can and can't charge for. Um, and the usual sort of thing that we do is to assess that against that guidance. And obviously, whether or not it's at this particular incident, uh, the people that we're providing policing services pay their taxes like anybody else, and I can expect the policing services. So, um, if there are any concerns around it, then that, that document is a very available document. Yeah. Um, I, I also, probably it's worth saying is that the government does have um, a fund through which local police forces can apply for um, money should there be an operation that goes over to, uh, that costs over one percent of their total budget, um, and indeed the government has topped up that fund in recent months. So um, we will at some point be making an application to that fund to help contribute towards the cost of the policing operations. Um, but um, we'll we'll do that at the appropriate time. Um, um, so that's that. So if I could. Then I think um, defer all of the other questions on, 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 on fracking to the substantive item and then as I say we'll publish the responses in full. Um, the next um, item um, is from um, Paul Lamb which is specifically around a um, question around CCTV um, and private CCTV and how they work with the police. There's a comprehensive um, um, response provided here, uh, which um, I won't I won't read out now, but we will publish it. Um, but also, I just wanted to say that when uh, we do have um, the North Yorkshire Community Messaging um, 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 System, and people can register as a private CCTV owner on that system, um, and uh, and that uh, that is quite helpful as well. So there is a way in which we can coordinate with private CCTV. TV um, through that um, through that system, but as I say, there there will be a comprehensive answer to that provided um, on on the website, and we I think we've got Paul's email, so we can uh, alert him to that as well. Um, then um, the next question is I think Alan, if it's okay, can we defer that into the substantive item again around how offenders are managed? managed as well? Yeah, uh, and then um, <coughs> likewise, um, just on on question on the twelfth question um, around sexual offenders being given advice or education, um, there is it, it, it not provided in the answer is also of course circles who uh, who we um, commission as a provider and they are. Um, an organisation that specialises in working with sex offenders um, and in changing their behaviour and the circles that we have in North Yorkshire are amongst the best in the country um, and so that is a really good service and indeed they are looking uh, at the moment as to how they can expand what they do into prevention work um, and they had a conference um, at uh, Ascombe Grange recently which a number of uh, police officers attended in which I attended in part as well. So we do um, have quite a lot of um, um, uh, support in place for, for, for those, although I have to say, you know, we could always do with more. Um, then on finally on the FOI uh, items. Um, in the first one, which is around the wait for 40 days, um, for 40 days, um, around the count, City of York Council contracts request, um, there was um, there was a need for consultation with a number of different parties um, on that request, which has taken some time um, before the internal review could be concluded. Uh, so um, that's why it's taken the amount of time it has. Um, and then on the uh, uh, question 16, which is about um, differing transparency <coughs> standards, there's a straightforward um, response to that, and that is each one is, is assessed on, an, on its own in its own merit. 
um, depending upon the facts of the case. Um, so they are looked at individually. Um, so that's it, I think, on the um, public questions. Um, but we will, as I say, put um, full answers on the website to those. Um, and any more that we get in during the course of this meeting, we will attempt to answer at the end, or if they require um, a more detailed <coughs> response, we'll do that after the meeting. Um, so can we um, now go on to the um, substantive item uh, this month, which is um, offender management. And um, if I could hand over Richard to you in the first instance. Thank you, Commissioner. So by way of introduction, Richard Anderson, temporary ACC local policing. And with me is Alan Harder from Super responsible for safeguarding. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, offender management, the offender management unit of North Yorkshire Police, uh, which for the benefit of the public, um, the scope of that coverage includes uh, the integrated offender management uh, structure, the, uh, the mapper arrangements, multi-agency public protection arrangements, and indeed our management of registered sexual offenders. Um, so um, I'll hand over to Alan. Um, and it's quite a comprehensive update to give. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, in terms of the uh, areas of discussion, uh, we will be I'm go, going through in detail in terms of the offender management structure that we have in place across the force, how that deals with the uh, officers who deal with the public protection, which are the registered sex offenders, that will then move on to the integrated offender management, IOM, as it's more commonly known as, the multi-agency public protection arrangements mapper. Uh, within each of those headings, we'll look at the reoffending of those people within those groups of people. And then finally, there's some uh, some points that I've included as to where we'll be moving into in the next uh, few months to come. Adam, can I just just can I just say, is it um, you're just talking about how it exists now? But is it worth saying? Because this team, this department, has gone through a period of change, yes. and it might be worthwhile just setting that in context a little bit. So, how, so, so, what we were, how it was structured, how it is structured now, because I think that's important in the context of this discussion. The, the presentation does include is how it was before, how it is currently, and hopefully as to where we might be going in the future as well. So, we've got past, present, and future. Okay. So, uh, moving on to the. Uh, overview of the structure of the force uh, and what the difference is between the offender management uh, element to it and the map element to it. Uh, the inter integrated offender management is a nationally recognised scheme with guidance produced by the Home Office. Uh, it seeks to bring a cross-agency response to crime and offending uh, and the threats faced by local communities. Uh, and it's going to improve the, or is intended to improve the quality of life in the communities and that's by reducing the negative impact by crime and reoffending, it's reducing the number of people who become victims of crime and also help improve the public's confidence in the criminal justice system and how we deal with those individuals. Previously, uh, the IOM scheme nationally focused on offenders who had been uh, dealt with for serious acquisitive offences such as burglary, theft of motor vehicles uh, and robbery. Uh, the IOM teams had responsibility for managing those offenders who were designated by the police as prolific or other priority offenders. And that was the titles that were given to them. And they were non-statutory offenders. Uh, the new IOM process that was created uh, at that time related to referrals coming from partner agencies, matrix scoring exercise would then be completed to, uh, with those partner agencies, and then the full details of how that now works will be covered later on in terms of how that scoring process takes place. In contrast, the multi-agency prote public protection arrangements uh, fall out or come out of the Criminal Justice Act 2003, uh, and that provides the establishment of the multi-agency public protection uh, arrangements. And each of the 42 criminal justice uh, areas in England and Wales have these structures in place, which is designed to protect the public, including previous victims of crime from serious harm by sexual and violent offenders, and that's where the, the difference comes. They do require local criminal justice agencies and other bodies dealing with those offenders to work together to deal with these the, the offenders. There is national guidance in relation to the MAPA, uh, which has been issued by the Secretary of State uh, under the 2003 Act, and that helps relevant agencies dealing with the MAPA offenders. Uh, 
MACRA itself is not a statutory body, uh, but its mechanisms are there to allow agencies and partner agencies to discharge the statutory responsibilities fully and to protect the public. Uh, agencies still maintain and retain their full statutory responsibilities as an agency, as an agency themselves. Uh, and it's important that agencies aren't compromised through the MAPA process against their own individual organisational uh, uh, statutory responsibilities. So that's, hopefully that explains the difference between IOM uh, and what MAPA is. Uh, in terms of North Yorkshire Police, uh, the Offender Management Unit sits within the Safeguarding <coughs> Command and it now consists of a detective inspector, uh, three detective sergeants, 12 protection, public protection officers, seven integrated offender manager uh, officers, advisor officer, civil order officers, and an inter internet monitoring officer. So they've all come together into one team, whereas previously they've been split, they've been managed locally on, on the commands, uh, and the integrated offender management used to sit within intelligence, so we've now brought them all together to deal with the management of offenders collectively. Looking at a national context, uh, there are about 88,000 registered sex offenders in the country, uh, which, is a, which is a number that keeps growing. Uh, and of, of those, there's uh, 36,000 who are on orders. Uh, and many of those orders relate to indecent images of children, which is an area that we've seen as the internet has increased. And that number increases year on year. Uh, in terms of the Offender Management Unit that North Yorkshire Police have created to uh, deal with and manage these people. That was created in June 2016. So from where there have been officers on the area, we brought them together in 2016 to create the Offender Management Team. Can I, can I just ask, so, so what were the reasons for doing that? Why? why? Uh, there's a number of reasons. Uh, one was in relation to the restructuring that had been taking place around, from government. Uh, around the national reforms about offender management and how that was taking place. It also linked in to ensuring that we've got consistency across the board in terms of what's being delivered locally uh, and it brings people together to make sure we've got a consistent approach uh, across the organisation with the same standards so that we can work with partners in the same way. Okay, but there was also a concern, mm -hmm. wasn't there, and a, a very legitimate concern, the, the number of... Um, the numbers going on to the sex offenders register was increasing. Yes. And there needed to be, uh, we needed to find a way of dealing with that. That's right. Part of one of the d drivers was how do we manage the demand that's yes, facing North Yorkshire exactly. Place. Uh, and I've got the numbers and I'll go to those in terms of how they've increased. Uh, part of the idea was instead of just having IOM uh, officers who deal with IOM and public protection officers who just deal with registered sex offenders, there was actually a degree of crossover between the two. So we upskill some of our offender managers who can deal with some of the sex offenders as well, so that we can make sure that we can deal with that demand. Okay, and so there was quite a lot of, um, uh, you did a, a, quite a comprehensive consultation process around those changes, and there was quite a lot of feedback that, that was received um, as part of the, um, the proposed changes, wasn't there? So, so what would be really interesting to understand is, is, um, um, is, uh, 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 now that the unit has been up and running for um, um, 18 months, uh, uh, how that, how what it's actually achieving relates back to the objectives that were set out originally, so the reason for the change, whether you've realised those benefits and whether or not um, uh, you have uh, successfully um, uh, been able to deal with the number of sex registered the RSOs coming onto the register and all the rest of it, and in addition, the original uh, remit of, map of IOM, which was the, um, the persistent and chaotic offenders. Okay. So, uh, do you want me to answer that now as I go through the presentation? Uh, if, if you could bear that in the back of your okay. mind as you go through, because, because it was a fundamental change in the way in which IOM had been, had been running. Uh, it, 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 and actually, North Yorkshire had a really good reputation for IOM, uh, and uh, and it ca it came it was uh, the governance of it came in under a different part of the organisation. And I think perhaps some of the things that we need to think about is is how how we can ensure that that um, more sort of strategic approach is 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 adopted in the future. So I think if we can bear that in mind as we go f 
as you go through this, I think I think that's quite important because there they are whilst there is some overlap between the sex offenders and between the other um, offenders that this unit looks after, that there are some where there is no overlap and it's making sure that we've got the balance right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you, you mentioned there that there's been an increase in terms of numbers of people that we manage. Uh, in 20, to put that into context, in 2016, uh, North Yorkshire Police managed uh, 697 registered sex offenders. Uh, that included uh, uh, the uh, sorry, 697 registered sex offenders that were in the community. Uh, there were also 198 in custody. So in total, we had just short of 900 uh, registered sex offenders. Uh, at this time, uh, we were man managing uh, 1,092. That's 793 in the community and 267 in custody. So if we then use those numbers as a basis in the four-year gap uh, in the future, by 2020, the numbers that we would be looking to uh, manage would be between 1,250 and 1,300 registered sex offenders. Uh, so in effect, over that four-year period from 16 to 20, those numbers have doubled. And that's the demand that we'll be looking to see in the future. Okay, so so correspondingly then, how many of the prolific and persistent chaotic offenders are you managing? Uh, at the moment, 253. 253, uh, yes. right. So uh, I do have some details in relation to how that compares to other forces in terms of registered sex offenders uh, within each of the respective sites. No. Okay, so we've got the numbers for the RSOs, but what we haven't got in here are the numbers for the other criminals. What, for the other forces? No, so, so, so we've got the numbers for the RSOs, so the 1,092 registered sex offenders that this... I've got those within my, within here, I've got those as well, so I can go through those with you. Right, okay, so, so I, I just, because they are set, that there are different cohorts, yes, aren't they? Yes, they are, they? very different. So what we've got is a lot of information about one cohort, but not a lot of information about the other cohort, and I just, it's that balance that I'm, try, I'm trying to get to. And, and I've got those details in yeah. here, and they're broken down per yeah. commands, and also in terms of the level of risk that they present mm -hmm. to yeah. communities okay. across North Yorkshire. Yeah. Just bearing in mind the numbers that you've given out, and the public will be going, oh my God, that sounds <coughs> awful. So what's the breakdown on the high-risk offenders as opposed to low-risk offenders? And is some of the explanation for the increase linked to the explosion of offending linked to social media? And is, do you have a, an answer to that? Yes, certainly. In terms of the uh, registered sex offenders, uh, broken across the three com the, the, the commands, uh, in terms of Hamilton and Richmondship, uh, at uh, six I. <coughs> Risk offenders right. across North Yorkshire area. How many high risk sex offenders is that unit managing? Uh, These are people who pose a significant risk to the public, aren't they? That's just why they're in that. That's place. right, just under 50. Under 50. Okay. So, try, just trying to explain to the public around the difference between a high risk offender, which might be the statement of being the obvious, and a low risk offender. Is there been an increase in the low risk offenders as opposed to the high risk offenders? Yes, uh, in terms of those offenders, uh, how they're graded around the, there's, a, there's an assessment process that's completed around uh, recognised models that, that are nationally adopted, we follow those, based upon the risk assessment, they identify the level of risk that, that individual presents and the nature of their previous offending, we end up with a, uh, whether or not they are very high, high, medium or low, uh, and those predominantly offenders that may be using the internet for these images are more likely to be at the lower end of that scale. So, so, so typically then, your low risk offender, of which there are most, what, what's the type of thing that they would have done? They, they, that might be related to uh, indecent images of children, or from the internet, yeah. uh, non-contact offences. Yeah. Uh, and the, what will happen is people will move through that spectrum from high risk over a period of time in terms of the length of time that they haven't been uh, offending, the period of time since the last offence, uh, and that will come into as well. So at one point, we may have a person who's very high, with all the support through the agencies and the partners that, that we work with, over time that person may become a low risk offender. It's <coughs> so just again to help the public, so, so the level of effort that goes into is proportional to the risk that these people pose? Very much so. How many very high offenders do we have? 
Only two across all of North Yorkshire. And so, without giving away tactical options, clearly that would be a focus of significant efforts to protect the public. You're looking at predatory sex offenders, in effect. Yes. So, when we try and look at the workload, it's trying to understand the risk that we're trying to mitigate on behalf of the community. That's right. So, just give some examples of those. So, you know, there's, there's a, unfortunately, because technology now allows people to share images. And when we talk about indecent images of children, often it's between children, isn't it? Some of it. Some of it can be, yes. So they still go on sex sexting. Thing. Yeah, sexting or sharing of images of their girlfriend with their, with their mates, all that sort of stuff, which 20 years ago wouldn't have registered at all. No. Um, what I'm trying to get away with is not thinking that we've got 900 predatory sex offenders out there in our community. That's right. These, these, these are people who may have committed offences for which they've gone to the uh, National Registered Sex Offenders Register for actually being at home and not being in contact with anybody. I appreciate the indecent images of children as a victim at the end of it, but in terms of that contact offending, uh, they, uh, there isn't that contact with a victim, physical human contact. Yeah, so I think, I think what what we're trying to understand is if I'm a member of the public and I hear that there are over a thousand registered sex offenders in North Yorkshire, that's quite an alarming number. And what we're trying to do here is, ex is ex put some context around that and explain that. So what you've said is there's, a, there's two very high risk sex offenders in North Yorkshire, which you are actively, obviously, managing in a very active way, whereas some of those that are at the bottom of the register might be on the register for a relatively short period of time, two years, uh, and the amount of, uh, 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 and you'll keep an eye on them and make sure that their behaviour doesn't escalate through your management processes, but they are not deemed, because they're low risk, to present a significant risk of harm to the public. That, that's right. Would that be a fair summary? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and also, I suppose, you know, you can go on to it. so how does that kind of benchmark across other, other force areas? So, you know, as we know, population is usually the main determinant of sort of demand, and there's a, there's a, there's a direct correlation between sort of the numbers that you should have based on your population. So, are we kind of out of kilter or are we kind of consistent? Uh, to address that now, as, as that's been raised, in terms of where we've gone... You like to ask questions, not in order. Yeah. No, it's okay. Just to make your life easier. Thank you. This is just like one, isn't it? Yeah. It's all right. By the time you get to the last slide, we're going to run out of questions. <laughs> no, that, 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 that's fine. No, Gilcher, please, uh, for the public's awareness, we are in a, a, a group of other forces, our most similar forces, which are based on uh, geography, the size of the forces, and the types of population that we have living with us. Uh, our most similar groups include uh, North Wales, Norfolk, uh, Devon, Cornwall, Suffolk, uh, Gloucestershire. Uh, so in terms of our numbers as to where we are, uh, we are probably mid-table uh, in terms of those numbers compared with the other forces uh, in terms of the, the number of registered sex offenders that they have and also the number of MAPA subjects. Uh, there's a lot of crossover between the two. Perhaps. So we're not an outlier. In relation to those. Just on that, it, can you just explain to the public who decides who signs the sex offender register? Okay. So it's not a police decision. No, no, no. it's the judicial decision. Yeah. So it's, it, it's at court. It's yeah. at court, basically. Yes. So, 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 just, so, can I then just, I just want to make sure that this whole presentation doesn't become about sex offenders, because, because there is a danger it could do. From the from the pro prolific offenders, so the 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 you know the. Um, uh, serious and acquisitive criminals. Can you sort of paint a picture of those those individuals and the types of things that they do and and how you manage how you manage them? So, in, in terms of those that would be within the uh, integrated offender management team, that the, the, those that predominantly have got a history of serious acquisitive crime, they will be for offences <coughs> such as robbery, uh, burglary, whether or not it's house or. Uh, Outbuildings, obviously, it's all included as one now. Uh, theft from shops, uh, theft from motor vehicles, uh, and thieving. Okay. At, at, so, because so these at a different level. Okay. Obviously. These people. So, just tie that back to the police and crime plan. These are the people because the the, pu pu the public's number one priorities was burglary. 
in the Police and Crime Cabinet, and some parts of the country have seen uh, uh, there are reports in, in the media this week of very big increases in burglary in other parts of the country because, um, because there is a concern that there is a shift away from serious inquisitive crime towards you know, things like sex offenders. And I want to make sure that in North Yorkshire we're not losing sight of those burglar, burglars, those prolific burglars, because we're having to deal with more sex offenders. And that's, that's at the sort of that's at the nub of this, if you like, and that's what I what would I need to understand. Okay. Because it because burglary is one of the number one priorities of the mm -hmm. of the public. No, I, I understand that, and I think s some forces have moved away uh, in terms of how they, would they include somebody within an IOM cohort who's stealing from shop. I appreciate there's a victim within that, uh, but in terms of the impact it has around a family home, that's sort of different. Uh, depending on what's being stolen. So the focus uh, around those people that burgle houses where people live, the risk that they present to a community uh, is uh, greater than somebody that perhaps burgles a shed, for example, because of the risk that they present to individuals. So I think in terms of the focus to those people that are involved with burglaries, we need to understand actually are they a burglar of a house, a burglar of a, a non-dwelling? They might do both. Pardon? They might do both. They do, they do, and that, that comes down to the intelligence picture, the previous offending of the, that individual, uh, what they've been convicted for, and what we know about them, and that comes down to having <coughs> the intelligence to be able to score these people uh, accurately with partners to understand actually how we're going to manage them. And when you say score, the same thing with sex offenders, you'll have high risk, medium risk, and low risk, and you deal with them uh, depending on that score. Th that's right, in terms of those people who are in the IOM cohort, that's based around the offending. There's multipliers of different offences, uh, and then they are assigned either a cohort of blonde, silver, or gold. Gold being the, the more uh, active people who present risks to the community that we need to deal with, and so there's greater interaction between the IOM staff and those individuals to make sure that they are managing them effectively. Okay. Oh, sorry. Well, so you mentioned that, there were, that at the moment there's 253 of these people uh, uh, who are being managed at the moment. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Right. How has that figure changed? <coughs> so before, bef bef before the change, before the MAPA team and the IOM teams were merged, so at, the beginning of 2016. at the beginning of 16, how many of these prolific burglars and acquisitive criminals were? We're North Yorkshire Police Manager. Before 2016, I don't have that number. Right, okay. With me, okay. It'd be, be a very interesting number to know because what it would do would give us an indication as to whether or not the co how, how the cohort has changed over has time. Changed? Yeah. It might be useful to explain whether or not who determines whether or not those people become political chaotic. Who decides that? Uh, the. the in terms of the identification of those people, that will come from three agencies, in effect, through uh, the National Probation Service, North Yorkshire Police, uh, and also the uh, CRC. So the, C a, so the CRC have managers. raised concerns about this, because because they, they, they have concerns that, that we need to have a look at the cohort, because they uh, uh, feel, I think, that perhaps um, the focus has shifted away from these types of criminals and towards the, the MAPA cohort and, and have raised and have raised some concerns. There are also a whole load of concerns around the way that the CRCs are operating um, as well. Uh, and indeed, the data that we receive from the CRC is, is well, it's not there for North York, well, it is there, but we're not allowed to see it. So, so we've got uh, an area of blindness, if you like, around the, the, the way that the CRC are managing this cohort of people in our communities. And so what I'm, trying, what I'm slightly concerned about is that we've got a sort of blind spot around the CRC performance because of lots of reasons, but which we won't go into now, and, and trying to understand how North Yorkshire Police is dealing with these, these people and to try and see, to make, make sure that that, that were, were fully sighted on, 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 on um, what these people are actually doing in communities and how we might be managing them? Okay, uh, well, we should, I can try and get that 
data for you for the 20, pre-2016, because I think that'll be interesting to see for you, and that will answer that question for you. In, in terms of the, the people who are within the IOM cohort, uh, <coughs> once they're identified and accepted, they go through a, a, a cycle, a six-week cycle, where they are uh, reviewed in terms of what offending they've uh, undertaken, do, been doing in that, uh, that period of six weeks, whether or not there's been any further arrests, whether or not there's any further intelligence, and also how they're working with uh, the police officers, CRC, in terms of some of the pathways towards uh, reducing their offending. Uh, that is reviewed every six weeks. That goes into a, uh, an oversight document so we can see how the cohort is moving from people moving from gold to silver, silver to bronze, or people going back into custody. That's where we see that at a, a, a force level, but so on an area level, they will follow those individuals through, so they'll be able to see somebody who's uh, been for three weeks at gold, for example, not three weeks, three cycles at gold, will come down to silver, and then we'll see that tra transition of that person going through as well. So at this, at the, uh, on area, they see that at that level. Okay, so, okay, so we'll, we'll come on to the rates of reoffending later on in the presentation, but, but um, I suppose it's the robustness of the data that we've got around this and how that is used to help us develop, develop a more strategic approach to managing offenders. And, 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 and I, think, I think some of this comes under your remit, doesn't it, Jenny, in terms of the board that you chair under the Local Criminal Justice Board. But, but this doesn't seem to be docking anywhere effectively at the moment in terms of the sort of relationship <coughs> management, and I, I, I think, and we perhaps need to have a think about next steps on that and how this area of business works with the local criminal justice board, because it moved out of Leanne's portfolio into, into the safeguarding world. I think I've got some ideas which will come yeah. on to, to yeah. the end of the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think from a business development and innovation board perspective, we've, we've already talked around all three partners about a review process. And then kind of what we haven't gotten to quite yet is what the next steps are. But I think there's definitely a, a level of buy-in from the CRC and NPS to review the governance arrangements and see that sitting back underneath the LCJV. Um, and I know we've briefly, ta I've briefly talked about that with Nigel and with Alan. And, kind of what benefit that could have, because I think there's more that we could do from this as well, an innovation more perspective about supporting uh, with interventions, work, particularly for offenders. Uh, and again, which would all benefit or kind of see an impact on the re reoffending work. Just to nail the point about burglary in North Yorkshire Police and so on, we're not stepping back from that, you know, and we're making a, an update later on performance. It's a number of cross-border operations this was the first from cross-border criminality in North Yorkshire, as you know, uh, that our serious crime teams and investigation hub, and indeed our operational officers, response officers, are tackling daily. So just give the public a reassurance that we are not the most forces that are uh, ignoring movement. Yeah, and there's been, I mean, there's been quite a lot of press about that, hasn't there? Yeah. 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 I mean, having said that, we had an update on the hubs a while back where burglary did seem to be lower down the list of priorities than some other types. Yeah, and I think, you know, the emerging picture of criminality is shifting, isn't it? You know, towards safeguarding, uh, we've just talked about some of the numbers there, um, and, you know, the challenge for myself and others is to balance the needs of the organisation and indeed mm -hmm. requirements of the public um, <coughs> around those different matters. Well, I think, I think the other thing we have to be conscious of is that the police service for a very long time has been obsessed around crime categories. <coughs> it isn't about the crime category necessarily because some of these persistent and chaotic offenders don't care what the <coughs> criminal offence they do. So whether or not it's a burglary or a car theft or a robbery, it's targeting their behaviour and their offending is the main issue. Um, and just to reinforce what um, Richard's saying, we're probably, the, I think we're about fifth in the country for lowest rate of burglary in the, in the United Kingdom. So that's not because we, we're not targeting it, we are focusing on it. But I will reserve the right that at times we have to focus on certain types of criminality because of the risk that's posed to the public. And I, I understand quite rightly the concerns of the public around burglary, but some of the things that we have to target that is they're not aware of. So, you know, the you know, 
given the choice, sometimes we have to make difficult choices about where we put our effort. But there is no policy, there is no directive in relation to treating burglary any less seriously than we've done previously. Otherwise, those figures wouldn't be reflective of where we are. Can I ask, Alan, on the, on the cohort, does that include, what well, I, I think I'm right saying, one of the fee, part of the feedback from HMIC, I think a year or so ago, could be slightly longer, was the organised crime management of offenders. Is that, uh, will that type of offender be included in the IOM? So I don't know whether it's drug dealing or something slightly different, but, but on an organised crime sort of umbrella rather than just a Depending on the offences that they've been dealt with for. Right. Okay. Uh, and that's not to dodge the question because there will be people who will be in the IOM cohort that may be part of organised crime groups. Uh, but because the IOM, uh, IOM cohort is around those identified offences, that's how they'll be scored. Whereas the uh, offender management unit will also have, uh, and we do have, the management of the serious crime prevention orders. So those people that we've successfully applied for and obtained serious crime prevention orders for, the offender management unit will be dealing with those people. So, and they're the people that you'll be talking about around organised crime. Does that answer yes, the question? Yes, So, moving on to uh, the slide uh, around public protection office. We, we, I've dealt with, or we've discussed quite a lot of that uh, already. But uh, in terms of the public protection offices, there's 12 offices across the force uh, providing that cover for the county. They are also sometimes referred to in other forces as Mossavo officers, just so if you've heard that term, that's what it relates to, uh, because they're responsible for the management of sexual offenders and violent offenders, which is obviously what Mossavo stands for. Uh, their role includes the completion of risk assessments. Uh, and I've mentioned earlier that the, we, we follow the national model for those risk assessments. There's two in place. One is in ARMS, which is an active risk management system for sex offenders which allows the officers to prioritise the work that they need to do by managing those offenders uh, effectively, uh, taking into account what's happening with that offender's life, so whether or not are they employment, are they in a relationship, do they have a house, are they, where are they living, to bring all that together. Uh, and the other risk assessment that's completed is referred to as the Risk Matrix 2000, which is used by the probation service, because they're obviously one of the partners in relation to management, of their uh, offenders and they manage uh, the risk offenders that are living in the community. Okay. Good, good question then, because um, in the Peel report, the HMI CFRS raised some concerns around the numbers, um, the numbers that each member of staff is having to, to handle. 12 public protection officers, given the number of RSOs and prolific offenders that they're having to handle, doesn't sound like a lot. So have you have you looked at and given that the HMI CFRS raised some concerns around the, their caseload in effect, how how are you addressing that? Okay, the in race the HMIC, uh, HMIC report that is the one that was released in March 2017 from the 2016 inspection. Mm. Okay, mm. Uh, <coughs> is that the one that you? <coughs> I would have thought so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in terms of that, what we've done is we've looked at how the uh, registered sex offenders are allocated uh, across the districts in terms of the number of officers, the numbers that they manage themselves so that there's a balance between those that are dealing with high, medium and low risk so they're not all, uh, so there's an equal distribution as far as we can. We've also uh, trained the uh, IOM officers in terms of how they use Mossavo. Uh, uh, and the risk assessments, so they've started to take on some of those lower level offenders, uh, registered sex offenders, so they can monitor them as well. So what we have been able to do from that then, is then produce a, a performance chart uh, around actually of our offices, what are the number of RSOs that they're managing in the community, whether or not that goes up and down each month when we review it, how that fits in with the uh, identified ratios, and the national guidelines for either the high or the number of the cohort across the board. So that's what we've been doing to make sure that we're, they are being managed effectively by the officers because they obviously need the time to be able to complete those assessments 
update uh, the national system visa in terms of those risk assessments that have been completed. So that is an area that we're aware of, uh, and that is something that we are working to improve the uh, ratios between offices and offenders. And how does that link with the other offenders that they're dealing with then? Because that, that, your answer there just couple relates to the sex offender cohort. So presumably, because these offices are dealing with everybody, they'll also have some of the prolific offenders on their books okay. as well. The, uh, in terms of the integration between the Public Protection Offices and the uh, IOM, that full level of integration hasn't occurred yet right. that we wanted to do. So when we're looking at those ratios, that is looking at the Public Protection Offices. So, am I right to say Public Protection Offices just do sexual offences, IOM do, you do acquisitive crime type stuff and some low level Correct, sex that's right. So can I ask a direct question then, Alan? Have caseloads for public protection offices gone up or down in the last couple of years? They've gone up, okay, uh, in terms of the number of uh, registered sex offenders that we have. Uh, and the, 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 we have, uh, there's a national, uh, nationally recognised way that that demand can be managed. Uh, and that is something that we've introduced through what we call reactive management in terms of how do we engage with some of those people who are registered sex offenders, which I was going to come to. So, Another direct question: Are we worried about the case load, or it, it, given that there's national sort of sounds like there's national sort of um, guidelines, do you, does it feel all right, or does it feel like it's sort of reaching a, you know, the, the bar where you go, it's sort of feeling like a heavy case load now? Well, I'm sure it's already heavy, but you know what I mean. There's, there's heavy and there's sort of getting to the point where something might need to change. Uh, there are some challenges uh, in terms of those offices uh, in in those roles. The demands that uh, are on them, and equally where some of those uh, registered sex offenders live because obviously we don't have it and always have an influence as to where they live either through the police or the probation service <coughs> so there are some challenges with that we are exploring ways of how we may be able to uh, increase resilience which is obviously through iom uh, and using some of their time to in support of it uh, identifying how those offices work uh, in terms of locations the number of reviews that they completed as well too try and make sure that is manageable, recognising that there is expected to be an increase of the number of registered sex offenders in the coming years. Uh, Nick, can I, on the IOM side then, given, um, I know we don't do sort of minute by minute updates on what people are doing, but um, it, given the IOMs now have a, a small amount of sex offend, low level sex offenders, the sex offenders that they're also managing, I suppose the inevitable conclusion that they're doing, spending less time on IOM offenders because they've now got this portion of work that is sex offenders. Does that make sense? What you're saying is if they're doing that, why aren't they doing with IOM? Well, they must be doing spending less time on IOM now because they also have this new cohort of all admittedly low level, but they have these other people to manage as well that they two years ago wouldn't have had. And can I just add another question on top of that? So there was some discussion also around the role of neighborhood policing teams in all of this and whether or not for some of the lower level um, offenders, whether or not the neighbourhood policing team should be taking more responsibility for, um, for, for, for managing them, particularly because they know their communities really well and very often know what these people are up to. So ha, 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 it's trying to sort of understand how the workload is being sort of Spread distributed, yeah, yeah. It's like organised crime, so they, I know that, that we had a update on that how recently and they've started pushing workloads down to you know neighbourhood level cops or whoever's the most appropriate person. but. The question is that happening with this? It, it is happening. It was only earlier on today I was speaking to one of the uh, uh, OMU sergeants uh, who was over uh, at Harrogate. They've been to see one of their uh, RSOs and they're actually going to a meeting with the uh, local safe neighbourhood inspector to discuss some of the IOM issues that are uh, within the area uh, and those individuals. So there is that communication between the local officers and the safe neighbourhood teams in terms of who they're looking at and what they're managing, which is obviously what we wanted to do because in terms of how do we manage those people. How, it really, how effective is that? Because this has been a really hard nut to crack, hasn't it? Because traditionally they've been seen as quite separate. I, I think we've still got work to do. Right. Uh, in, in moving up forward <coughs> and identifying uh, with those people who are here within our IOM cohort, actually which ones are best sat neighbourhoods 
which are best using the IOM offices uh, and using the right people with the right skills to tackle those people who are presenting the community with those, those issues. You're right. Okay. <laughs> uh, in terms of the uh, public protection officers, uh, I've explained the numbers of how they're uh, distributed across the uh, commands. Uh, we've also got dedicated civil orders officers uh, within our team. These are officers that proactively make applications to courts against people who've not been convicted of, uh, of offences, but their behaviour presents a risk of harm, sexual harm to others. So there's two types of orders that they can apply for. One is the sexual harm prevention order, uh, and the second being sexual uh, offences prevention orders. Uh, the, just going back to the HIC appeal inspection that you referred to earlier on, uh, that does uh, include comments in relation to the civil orders officers that the force uses legislative powers to good effect. Uh, during the previous 12 months, which was up to June 2016, the force issued 285 sexual harm prevention orders, of which four had been breached. So in terms of the proactivity to tackle those people that are uh, presenting a risk to the organisation, we're doing that on the front foot to try and uh, reduce that risk. So how does... Go on. So, you've got your registers, so now you've got your registered sex offenders, Yes. and you've got these ones that aren't, these offenders who might have been sex offenders registered, but have, still need management of, of one kind or another because That's they've right. got an order attached to them. So, that figure doesn't cover the workload that the, just your RSOs themselves isn't just the workload of the team, there's, there's other things on the side. So that's what they need to manage as well. So being proactive in terms of uh, getting those orders, uh, and we don't rest when we've got an order. If there's an order with prohibitions in place against that individual, we need to make sure that we're policing it as well. So you've got so 1,092 mm -hmm. plus another few hundred, it sounds like. Yes. Orders, right? and, and how does, so if you've got a team there that, that specialise in civil orders, we also obviously have other people in the organisation who do other civil orders, so DPOs. Yes. How does how do they how does because there's a there's a strain around the DPOs and the capacity within the legal team to be actually to manage that. How do how, do they do they link together at all? So or is there say, an opportunity there? When you say DPO, domestic domestic violence protection okay. orders. Yes, the, the officers within the uh, offender management unit work with legal services in terms of preparing the uh, the bundle but, uh, and the application have to go to court. So they do work alongside them. Right, but there isn't, there because that's something we're wrestling with, isn't it, is in the legal team is, is the... Well, I think that workload includes supporting um, the OMU with this work. So, so the legal teams, um, the new orders of all descriptions are, you know, not that old now, and they're still getting to grips with the demand that causes, I think. So their support includes... Then as well. Then as well, yeah. But I think that they... Who is the yeah. and who is best placed, oh, what's exactly. the skill set of exactly. them, and what support does our team need to be able to make things happen, and how much are we pushing them, and yeah. it's all wrapped Should in the same issue, because there's only going to be an increase in demand. Yeah. And um, it makes things preventative then from, from someone's behaviour escalating to a, to be a criminal. Necessarily, you know, we're trying to prevent crime here, prevent harm to victims. What is the well, we have had quite high profile examples where an individual didn't go through ultimately a court process where we still got a sexual prevention order, which did make some headlines as part of our commitment to actually protecting people because we were concerned about that person's particular behaviour. Um, so, yeah, there is that option, but you have to be really conscious and careful because this is quite an intrusive yeah. power. And obviously we need to be proportionate about how and when we use that, depending on the, the risk that that individual may pose to the public. And that's obviously been tested through the court process. And that's subject that the officers make that decision, so that when they're presented with the case, they might not reach a criminal decision for whatever reason, but they think we need to do work here to prevent harm. That's right. Yeah. Because an investigation uh, may not result in a charge, yeah. uh, but that uh, <coughs> offender still presents a risk. So it's trying to manage that risk and reduce that risk that that individual presents uh, and that is one of the ways that we can do that. And do you see the number of those orders increasing over time? Yeah, they proceed to be an effective use of powers? 
I, I think they will. Uh, in terms of the use, uh, we, we police them, we can identify that there's been breach of those orders, uh, which is positive that we're policing them. Uh, it's, uh, it's not positive that people are breaching them, but we need to make sure that we're doing that in a proactive way. Which you need to be over in the first place. E exactly. So, and, and that's th those orders are complemented by another member of the team that's joined us uh, only in like recent months, which was the uh, appointment of a, an internet monitoring officer, because a lot of these uh, orders will relate to people not using the internet or keeping their browser history available for inspection so that we can review it. So we've got a, now a dedicated officer that is able to review uh, registered sex offenders' internet history and usage to identify what they've been looking at because that obviously indicates potential risks. And that's been done uh, and that has already identified that there's been uh, five breaches of orders uh, and three additional offences as well. Okay. I obviously don't want to give any tactical things away that one does to sort of monitor these things, but um, on the face of it, it sounds not easy to get around, but you know, you could buy a phone from a shop and have it, you know, locked in a drawer that you don't tell the offender manager about. How easy is it to monitor someone's use of the internet nowadays? There's a number of ways to do that. Yeah, okay. Uh, and that's what I actually do. <laughs> right, yeah. I'll take that. Just, just on a broader point, because I think, I think just to reassure the public, that we do spend an enormous amount of time trying to assess the demand across the entire organisation, because the difficulty when we deep dive into a particular topic area what you will get is um, a requirement potentially for resources to go in a particular area. And those resources can, can, can only really come from one place. There's a set number, if you like, of individuals that we can task to do certain roles. So we, you know, we're just looking at response, we look at the serious crime teams, we look at the investigation hubs, we look at roads policing. All of those areas potentially have growth. And some of this is an area that we know there's been growth. And I know previously there's been an investment into those areas um, but it's just to reassure the public that kind of we don't allow people to sit there and drown. We have to try and identify um, areas where there's excessive demand on people. But the point I make to my own staff is I expect them to be busy. And it's just making sure that they're appropriately busy mm. and they're working on the things that are of significance. And particularly in this area, I do think there is a, there is a pushback in relation to how well we do work effectively together with the other partners and what's being offered. because. Certainly IOM has been around a long time. It started off in Holland in Dordrecht. It was picked up mm -hmm. by Blackpool, the Tower Project. There is still um, the jury's out about some how effective mm -hmm. some of this actually is. So there is something around how we can work with the evidence is there unless you offer people jobs, they've got a stake in society, they've got a family or social network that they go into when they leave prison. Mm -hmm. All of those are factors, a lot of which we can help with, but a lot of which we can't deliver against. Um, so it's, it's one of those classic collaborative worlds that we have to try and keep pushing on. Thank you. Uh, I think there were a couple of questions from the, from the public in relation to this area. One was in relation to whether or not uh, sexual offenders were given advice, education about conducting relationships. Uh, the, there are courses that are available whilst people are in custody uh, within in prison. But they are open to people who fully admitted their offending. So if somebody's pleaded not guilty and they're not accepting what they've done, they're not open to those courses. So it's where people have made those admissions. Uh, Is it still voluntary, Alan, even if someone's admitted the guilt but sort of just doesn't want to do it? Yeah, it is voluntary, and that's my understanding of it's it very the same much. Circles. So. Uh, yeah. and, and that's a sex, a sex offenders treatment programme. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the programmes that people prefer to go to are the one to one groups because it's easy to discuss with that individual what, what you've done and the reasons for that, as opposed to admitting and talking about your offending in a group setting, which is different. So there's obviously a greater demand for that, and I think uh, there was the reference to circles early on. Uh, we also, there, was a, there was also a question in relation to checking on internet usage. Uh, I think I've explained that uh, in, in answering that question. And there was also another question in relation to are appropriate steps taken to ensure that appropriate accommodation uh, is in place and not just simply for somebody to leave uh, prison and go and live with family or, or girlfriends. Uh, in relation to uh, macro offenders, if they're going to be released, they are likely to be released from prison to an approved premises, mm -hmm. uh, which is allowed time for a move-on plan to be developed uh, to another uh, location. 
There's also license conditions by the National Probation Service which will direct where an individual can live. That address will be checked whether or not it's suitable or whether or not there's anybody who may be uh, at risk or vulnerable there. Uh, but we need to recognise that those people that are released who aren't on license uh, can actually reside potentially where they wanted to. But because they're registered sex offenders, there is a requirement for them to inform us where they live, uh, which, which will happen. Okay. We, we do it, we do have a, a free process in North Yorkshire though, don't we? So, um, so, so because we we have in North Yorkshire clearly an issue because we've no prisons in North Yorkshire. So the through the gate services that we offer are, are, are problematic because of because we don't have any prisons. So therefore, those links between mm. people coming out of prison and into our communities, the provision of accommodation, and all of those things are, are complicated <coughs> and challenging. Um, but we do we do have approved premises for for uh, uh, sex offenders in this county. It, it, it takes people from other parts of the country as well. But, That's right. but we do have we do have those specialist facilities here, um, unlike prisons, for example, which we don't. And Sorry, I was going to ask for those who we can't accommodate <coughs> in North Yorkshire, do they get managed by the force where they for the approved? premise they, they go and end up in, or do we have to do some sort of a management of them as well for when they come back? Okay, uh, the, we're under the MAPA arrangements, uh, it is possible to have what we would call a MAPA meeting, depending on which level of support we need from agencies. So that would either be at MAPA level 2, let MAPA level 3. So if somebody's going to be released from, from prison, uh, the meeting may be convened if we haven't been able to identify an appropriate premises. Uh, that would be including the appropriate partners, so perhaps definitely housing, uh, probation, police, uh, the individual uh, public protection officer. So if that person was moving from, uh, for example, uh, another force area into North Yorkshire, we would be present at that meeting and the other force would be present at that meeting. So there is that continuation around knowledge and involvement because at some point that person will leave North Yorkshire and go back to their original mm -hmm. force as a move on plan and there needs to be that well, sharing and accurate that information. No, some people do come to North Yorkshire they, and they want to stay here. Uh, if that's the case what will happen is there will be a transfer of that individual normal, uh, within the, uh, the MAP process and North Yorkshire would then become responsible for that individual. Likewise, there will be some people that move out of North Yorkshire to another force, uh, and that's what it will happen. And they, the full record is transferred to the force area where they're living so that we can identify the full history, all those assessments, risk assessments that have been completed previously so we know what the risk is. Uh, and if somebody's coming from another force into North Yorkshire, we get told about those and what's happening. So does that answer your question, Tom? Yes, I have one, I'm afraid. On, on, uh, as I understand, housing and employment in particular are seen as the two key sort of um, mm. parts of a rehabilitation process. It, I, the reason I sort of caveat this is when I went out with an IOM sergeant, I think it was probably 18 months ago, so things may well have changed, but certainly housing was seen, uh, housing partners were seen as a real issue in terms of coming to the table and attending meetings and, you know, pulling their weight, as you might say, and I didn't know what, you might be answering this later, so put it later in the slides if you say so, but... Um, is that still a, a concern? How, if it is, how we're going about trying so, to? And just to add to that, though, part of the problem that we also have is the notice that we are given when people are released from prison as well. That can be problematic as well. And we certainly have members of the public come to us who've had a whole range of issues associated with people being released from prison. The, I do deal with that later oh, on when I come okay. to the, no. the, the macro element. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Can I just ask one final question on the <laughs> yes, then. Uh, sorry, if the, tell me straight away if this has already been covered. I haven't kept up with all the charts necessary. But, um, so you've got, under PPO, you've got the RSOs. There's also the other category that falls in under PPO, which is violence. How many violent offenders are we managing that don't fall under the RSO category? Obviously? Okay. In, in terms of the public protection side, uh, I think we have the public protection officers that are trained, the Mossimo training, and, and deals with that. Uh, the RSOs that would be formed part of that cohort, that, that number, 
are within the mapper group. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at the mapper group, the mapper group is split between the sexual offenders and then the violent offenders. Mm -hmm. So the violent offenders are predominantly dealt with uh, within, uh, within the, the mapper arrangements by the National Population Service. So okay. they would be the lead uh, force around that element. Okay. okay. So and our public <coughs> protection officers aren't necessarily therefore managing those violent offenders. So we wouldn't necessarily be the lead agency but we might that individual, but we'd have an input. Okay. So when we talk about lead agencies for MAPA, there's three, which is the police, the uh, National Probation Service, and then the prison service, because that's where they'll either be with one of us at one of those points. Okay. Well, we, we just hopefully again for the public if we can bring around what the visor database is. Okay, uh, the, the visor database is a national uh, police, it's a, it's a national computer system that holds secure information <coughs> on those people that are subject of the map arrangements, registered sex offenders. And that is where the risk assessments that I mentioned earlier on are recorded uh, and held uh, on the system, so all time data, so we know exactly at that point what the risk assessment was and what the considerations were and what's happening with that individual's uh, life. That is accessible by trained officers, so it's not just every police officer, it's a, it's, it is a restricted system. So all of the public protection officers can gain access to it, uh, and equally those people who are in probation. So uh, if we have a probation officer and a police officer working with that individual, they're both able to see that same record. So when I talked about the individual moving from one force to another force area, the visor record would go with them, so they've, they've, got, the, they've got the complete history with that. Uh, and it's a system which you need access to be able to see a normal record. So not everybody will be able to see everybody's record. You need to have a policing purpose uh, to be able to access it and see it. But the other thing you know about, we were talking before about how you monitor people. So anything related to a particular nominal or individual who's on that register that gets stopped in another force area or breaches something, that gets flagged to yeah. the officers and then they see that on it's like a daily down yeah. so some of this is automated yeah. so when we have a conversation around the number of people people are managing some of this is automated yeah. so you may have a low risk offender who suddenly pops up in another force area that you then that informs a conversation on whether or not you need to up their their rating yeah. because they've been found it you know it, oh, somewhere right. they shouldn't be yeah so but that that's been around for quite a while and that's kind of one of the things that's probably more advanced the violent sex offenders bit rather than the political and chaotic. We don't have a similar system, we obviously have a national computer, but it's not as intuitive, shall we say, in helping people manage their work there. And you said you had a major officer, so is that one person dedicated to that system? That's, that's one person to make sure that those records are accurate, uh, they're up to date, and when there's requests for information from other forces, they're being shared as well. So. Uh, a public protection officer will be able to put their updates on it, but there's uh, necessary maintenance uh, of that system that is required in each of the force, and that's what it is. Presumably they pass on the intel to the officers, don't they? Yes, so the, the, the recognised things within the system that if the, of, the, the public protection officer needs to be aware of, they'll do that, or they'll include that within the briefing within the team so that people are aware of it. Okay, moving on to the integrated offender management. So IOM uh, can complement the other statutory arrangements that are in place, su such as MAPA. Do you know what I think would be really helpful? Would be a diagram of how this how this team is structured. I think that would just just to make it really clear. So what we've got is a list of things, but actually for the public looking at this, what would be really helpful would be a diagram. Anyway, just a just a suggestion. I'm sure we can put something on the website. Yes, oh, it, would be, it would just be really helpful. A diagram would be really helpful because you could see then at a glance how this 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 function is set up. Sorry. No, it's I okay. Just, I just think it just would make it clear. Uh, so, in, in terms of IOM, uh, it, it, it complements uh, other arrangements that are in place. Uh, uh, 
and what we're trying to do is seek the achievements through a combination of invent, in, interventions with the individuals, either through enforcement, uh, persuading those people to comply and the benefits as to why they, they should comply, and supportive offender engagement as well. I think the, the, it's worthwhile noting that the engagement from an IOM element, uh, it's not mandated, they don't have to do that, it's, it's, uh, it's something that we try to do with them to try and reduce any further offending uh, unless there's orders in, in place as part of a, a, a court okay. On a sort of layperson's perspective, Alan, is that, is that team have a sort of carrot and stick approach? Some of them will be uh, sort of nicey nicey with offenders trying to sort of build a relationship and understand maybe why they've done it and some of the family issues or whatever it might be. On the other hand, you, you know, if you don't do this, you know, we'll come and arrest you again and put you back in. You know, is, it, is that how it works? The, there are incentives for people because obviously there will be people who don't want to go back to prison uh, if they're unlicensed and they don't want to be recalled and they want to move away from uh, uh, the previous criminal mm -hmm. history. Uh, there will be some people who will perhaps potentially set out with that and for a number of reasons might go back to what they've done before. Uh, and what we need to do is work with that individual to try and reduce that from happening. Okay. Yeah. So in, ter in terms of uh, the IOM aspects, we've got seven dedicated officers who deal with the IOM across the force, uh, supported by an intelligence officer in terms of briefing that information to that. So can I just ask, sorry, so, the, so those, so seven officers, if we, we know the numbers of people that they're, the, the, their caseload, if you like, do we, do we have any sense of um, the amount of criminality those people are responsible for. So there's a rough statistic that is often banded around that around a third of all crime in an area is is as a consequence of people reoffending. Do we do we know what these people contribute in terms of our sort of overall crime pattern? The I don't have a number to be able to say to you that the uh, IOM cohort at York is responsible for X percentage of the crimes in York, that, and that's what you're asking. Roughly. Uh, I don't know. Because it, it gives you a real sense then of, you know, the sort of scale of this and the importance of it and all of the rest of it. And also our ability to be able to really understand whether or not we've sufficiently sort of gripped this, if you see what I mean. No, I, I do see what you mean, because the performance uh, information that is shown on one of the latest slides uh, provides some numbers, but it's understanding those numbers in terms of one person may be arrested for, uh, it's one of, sorry, there, there may be an occurrence where somebody's arrested for, but whilst they're in custody, they're arrested for further offences, uh, and charged with different offences as well. So, and that's where the, the information that's included within the uh, performance data we need a better understanding of that to be able to answer that question to you of this person was responsible to a percentage of crime within your for example. Because we've got gaps in the data need. from the CRC as well. So oh, and that's what we need to do. And that's one of the so recommendations at the there, end of actually we need to improve what we, we have and we need to un truly understand the impact that uh, the IOM cohort or an individual within that cohort is having within the community. And within that, what interventions are working which interventions are not working and adopting <coughs> best practice or stopping doing things if they're not working and uh, dealing with it that way. That's certainly a recommendation that we have listed at the end. So the plan is also your evidence basis to have the IO model is successful as well because you can look at it over a period of time and yeah. say what it's and the problem, part of the problem is that the time periods are quite short. There are three oh, yeah. chunks, aren't yes. they? Yeah. Because of the nature of yeah. the way yeah. you have yeah. to manage cohorts in terms of yeah. every offending to have that yeah. useful data. There have been bespoke pieces of work undertaken following a specific cohort of offenders um, by probation, multi agency partnerships, community safety partnerships in terms of their responsibility to reduce reoffending in the community. But they tend to be, as you've said, small cohorts of people. Um, from a longitudinal perspective, you need to have a longitudinal study about the criminal uh, behaviour of those individuals on quite a long cycle, and, it, and it's about having that 
that ability to follow a, a set cohort of people in and out for a long enough period of time. I to mean, make we've that talked assessment. about doing that by the LCJB, haven't we? Yeah. It's, looking yeah. at, it's looking at that. Yeah. Yeah. There's also the practicality, which is um, the cynical cops in the room when we arrest a burglar. You know, we probably can prove one or two offences, but cynically, we probably know they're responsible for a ten or fifteen. Mm. And you know, we're in the business of having been able to only prove, and therefore, the evidence base we can use is only the ones that we eventually charge them with. But interestingly, you know, the crime rate on that particular council and state will plummet. Yes, and then when they're let out of prison again, it'll go yeah. back up. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So it's just trying to fill that gap, and it's it's more around how we get the intelligence of, and you can do some of that based on the MO for that particular mm. offender because they tend to stick to the same MO. Okay, so in, in terms of the integrated defender managers, uh, sorry, uh, management, I've explained previously that the three different cohorts, bronze, silver, and gold, uh, they're identified through uh, multipliers for uh, offences, whether or not they've been charged, whether or not they've been arrested, suspected, intelligence, and that all comes together to give us the grading as to where they are. So for those people that are identified as being gold, and those that are presenting the, the highest level, uh, they are statutory cases that are held by probation offender managers uh, and a police officer is assigned to work with that individual as well. So they are cases where there will be a minimal, uh, sorry, the minimum number of contacts that there would be uh, is uh, tw twice weekly, uh, up to uh, over four times, uh, depending on what support that individual needs and the interactions with them. Uh, in terms of silver, that will be managed by a police officer, an IOM police officer, uh, with some support from probation where that's needed. And that level of intervention is not less than twice weekly. So there's a grading in terms of the number of interactions between the police uh, and that offender uh, over that period of time. And in terms of those bronze cases, they'll be managed by probation uh, uh, in, in terms of that. Okay. okay sorry, can I ask, is, is that therefore in a sense what you mean by um, supportive offender engagement? So yes, so you have your offender, you need to work with them to try and uh, put them onto pathways. Right. So that might be towards a, a, a drugs intervention, mm -hmm. it might be towards employment, to make sure that that person is getting the support that they need to keep them out of that uh, cycle or circle of criminality. Do they have to be police officers? Is there, is there a police staff model that goes alongside so this this work, or is that you know you need warranted powers or whatever it might be for X, Y, and Z? There, there are some forces that have gone down the route of having uh, this, uh, police staff to do it. Uh, there are other forces that haven't done that, and there's uh, benefits on one aspect to it, uh, and also negatives as you as you expect. There are occasions when the people that would be dealing with may be committing offences that those officers come across, so there needs to be a power of arrest in relation to that. Uh, so that is one of those considerations, so it's how do we manage that if it's a member of uh, police staff without those warranted powers. So that's again going back to what is the risk that individual presents, are they best being managed by a police officer, a member of support staff, uh, and if we're talking about the demand for the future, how would we look at that uh, in terms of that cohort and how we deal with that. Uh, so in terms of the number of people within the IOM cohort as of January this year, uh, 253, which is split between 218 <coughs> males, 35 females. Uh, and across the commands, uh, if we look at, uh, sorry, the, the numbers, that's 64 within that gold uh, cohort, 46 in silver mm. and 36 in bronze. And there's also 79 other, the other being those that have come outside of it and are uh, almost at the end of just a, a watching uh, brief around those individuals. Uh, it's really key to work with partners in relation to that. So the partner agencies that we're working with are the Community Rehabilitation Company, which we've heard mentioned before, uh, CRC, or InterServe, Probation Service, uh, Youth Offending Team, Justice Team, Courts, Prisons, CPS, Local Authorities, uh, we also need to work with, depending on the individual, children's social care and the impact of that because some of the offenders may have families that we need to uh, be aware of and help them. 
Job Centre Plus education and uh, drug and alcohol teams as well. So there's a number of people uh, that we will work with in order to provide that necessary support to that uh, in individual. Uh, that links into one of the questions that came from the public in relation to is there any meaningful work uh, being supported? Sorry, are, the, are we doing anything meaningful to ensure that these people are getting employment uh, when they're coming out of prison uh, if they've served sentences of 18 months or more? Uh, the police aren't involved with actually identifying suitable employment or getting that person a job uh, when they come out of prison. But there are a number of uh, processes in place that do support those individuals. So, so for example, people who are in prison, uh, depending on which category of prison they're in, uh, and those that present a lower level of risk may be released on day release through the release and temporary license process where they could go to work job a day. Uh, and that is something that is organised through the prison. Uh, when people do come out of prison, uh, the National Probation Service will uh, undo, assist individuals attending interviews, building CVs and giving that interview advice towards employment. Uh, and for IOM, uh, people on IOM, who is a company called Advanced Personal Management, who are involved with, as a part of agency, uh, evolved around getting people into employment and assisting them on that one-to-one -one element uh, and signing po signposting people to employment as well. So albeit we don't take a active lead in finding employment for those people, there are processes in place to make sure that something is available through other partners to do that, if that answers that question. Okay, can I, just on that specifically, um, I understand that IOM officers can off also offer um, uh, work cards to go and work on a, a building site and the like kind of day-by-day -day basis as a kind of incentive um, for good behaviour and so on. Is, is that right? And is that, how is that funded out of the, is that funded by the team or is that both funded by one of the partner agencies? I'm not aware that we're doing that. Okay. Right. Certainly in terms of the schemes that we've got for people who've been able to follow the pathways, mm -hmm. there are a number of schemes that we do have, which is, you know, in terms of reward. So one of the schemes that we have within North York Place is a gym scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, which is funded uh, through the, 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 the LPCC, which is for those people who are low risk, uh, who've been following the pathways uh, in terms of stopping offending and reduced intelligence, where they uh, are issued with a gym pass uh, and a number of different gyms around the county, so where they can go uh, and obviously look after themselves physically and, and maintain their fitness. And that is seen as a benefit to those individuals that have been successful within that program. I, I, I think though, I, I think this is where we've got a major challenge really though, because what, what I think, and this comes to sort of Jenny's area of business as well, and it's, it's how we join up what the community safety partnerships might be, off of, uh, be able to offer in terms of interventions, what the community <coughs> can offer in terms of interventions, how we work with the CRC, because this is largely CRC work as opposed to MPS work. Um, and uh, how we actually understand and get a, a, a much more substantive and coherent offer um, that we know has um, that has a higher likelihood of actually working. And at the moment, we're a long way from, from that. I think there's definitely more that we can do together if we can understand the cohort better and the things that they need and, and what they can get from the current pathways that are available through the CRC and MPS then there's more than we can do from a commissioning perspective, definitely, to support the force to focus our resources on kind of key cohorts or key interventions and, and then measure the impact that they have. Yeah, and you're going ha you, to want different things for different, different so female offenders, you might want something quite different to, to, to uh, other, other offenders. So I, th I, I think this is an area that we really need to look at through your, your board, Jenny, which is um, h how do we actually um, set a benchmark for where we are now because I don't think we know where we are now um, and then where do, where, where do we want to go what do we want to achieve and then what are the what are the interventions that we can put in place working with our partners to try and get to where we get to and it will link with out of court disposals as well um, so so I think we need to think of it in the round more than um, well, we, 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 we've, we've got a random gym scheme that came through the community fund, which is sort of the situation that we're in at the minute. Uh, a, couple of, <coughs> uh, a couple of clarification points as well, given that it's, uh, it's a uh, uh, public broadcast meeting. 
Do, do you accept the, the, the premise that that question is based on number 11, i.e. people who have served more than 18 months in prison are the most likely to reoffend if not given an alternative? <coughs> or is that a view of the questioner? I, I think we need to have a look at why someone's gone to prison, what the offences are, because I don't think it's just around the sentence length that somebody offends for when they come out. It might be what was the offence that they went in for. So we need to understand that. Uh, we also need to understand when somebody comes out, actually, what is the period of time between uh, release and reoffending. Uh, and we also, I think we also need to understand when somebody reoffends, what do they reoffend with? So uh, in some co, uh, in, in some forces around the country, they will look at perhaps someone's been in uh, prison in relation to cocaine uh, and cocaine related offences. But when they've been released, they've changed and they've come away from cocaine and uh, at that level of drug use and they are offending but with other drugs which don't have the same impact. So is that a benefit? That is a question that actually we need, I don't think we've got an answer to that. Uh, but it, that, that's a question that we need to ask ourselves, I think, is have we reduced some community harm by doing that? Is it a positive? Or we are still committing offences? Uh, and I'm not sure if that really answers your question. I, I think it's I think it's a lot wider than 18 months and the offender. straightforward as that as the premise for the question. I think that completely answers that was really helpful. Um, and the other and the other point was again because it's a it's a medium being broadcast to the public, the distinction between a community rehabilitation companies jurisdiction, because I, I would imagine a lot of people don't even know what a CRC is, and that of the National Probation Service. So what, 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 what the, the clear demarcation lines in terms of who's responsible for what. Because I don't think people who were, if they were in the room, would understand that. Is a is a really simple way of just saying that well, that's national, and, and local is run by community rehabilitation companies. It's not quite as simple as this, but the um, the national probation service in the main manage the more severe, the higher risk category of offenders, and the CRC manage those with a lower risk. But it's all to do with again over scores as they measure, which is a combination of risk and other factors that go into a score for somebody being released or somebody under a community order. Um, what we talk of as the CRC is the, I mean, it's the community rehabilitation company, yes. but it was essentially dealt with by a probation service at one point, yes. and it has now been, been given on contracts to local companies. So the, the, for the public, the, essentially the national probation service is split into one part kept um, for high risk offenders, which is still the national probation service, and the lower risk offenders were dealt with now by these CRCs which are effectively private companies who get paid by results for reducing rate offending well, effectively. Theory. Um, so it was their job to stop those lower level uh, offenders from reoffending theoretically. It should be noted that the staff who now make up the CRC were are in large those who were already dealing with those people for the probation service the obviously. Can I, can I ask a in, in North Yorkshire, there's a the region that North Yorkshire includes is, is Humberside and Lincolnshire. Mm. And yes. that's how it's split yeah. up, which is slightly unusual for North Yorkshire in the sense yeah. lots of the work that our collaboration is either with Cleveland and Durham or with the other Yorkshire forces, not necessarily with Lincolnshire and anything, I don't think, and, mm. and less, more so with them aside, but it's still less frequently. So it's slightly odd in that sense. Just, just as a follow up to, to that question, for our seven IOM officers um, who are having to deal with low level RSOs, do they have the necessary training to be able to do that? Are we making sure that they do have that training? And do they also have access to all the risk systems and so on that they would need to access in order to provide, uh, download the information that they need and also um, record the information? That they yes, they do. Uh, those officers that were in the <coughs> camp have all had a most of a course they've been trained mm -hmm. and they've got the necessary skills to able to do that. Uh, and uh, there, there was a gap between when they've been trained and when we're starting to be able to deliver what we wanted to do uh, uh, under that of offender management unit. So there have been, uh, not retraining, really actually, let's go through the training, let's bring you back up to speed to AV so you can complete those risk assessments appropriately, fully and safely to make sure it's accurately recorded. So, yes, they are. But they're based with the NPS, aren't they? They are co-located in a number of places, uh, locations across the county. Uh, but, albeit they're co-located, they're still able to go out and do those risk assessments with other people. So, if when they need to update Visor, they'll go to one of those appropriate places where they can do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
we have heard there's practical issues around that, but we can discuss those outside of this meeting. Okay. <laughs> um, right. Well, we won't mention the word car parking. <laughs> okay. uh, so, moving on to the uh, reoffending rates. Uh, this, this slide is an extract of uh, a performance uh, data set that we provide to <coughs> people who attend the Business Development Innovation Board. Uh, we share it with partners that are involved with uh, the IOM cohort and the managing of those. Uh, this is just a, uh, a snapshot in terms of the number of people within the respective cohorts, bond, silver and gold, how they are distributed across the, the force in terms of numbers. Uh, and this, we need to understand just some of the uh, health warnings, as it were, that come with this data. Okay, and, and the reason for that is the uh, cohort can change very quickly. We've talked about it's been on that short cycle of six weeks. Uh, and so when that is produced, somebody goes into prison, comes out of prison, it, ha it can have a significant impact in, in terms of that because of the numbers that we're dealing with. But that's why we need to look at this over the longer and term. And that's it, that's and it. And have a look at the trends. So the purpose of just including this uh, was actually to, to sort of see some of the numbers that are involved, some of the where they are around the county, uh, and what the levels are of the people that we're dealing with. Okay, but so it's helpful that we've got this to get that sense, but what it doesn't do is give us any real meaningful information about recidivism recidivism rates. It doesn't give us the level of detail that perhaps you would want that we need to be able to identify what's working effectively and where we need to go to in the future. So so, so, so obviously we've got the report from the CRC that came out last year um, which says that our CRC performance has a 49.57% uh, reoffending rate. If you compare that with and the comparisons are slightly problematic, but anyway, with 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 Merseyside, that depending on whether it's been adjusted or not, it's either thirty four or forty one percent. So that would suggest that we've got a higher um, reoffending rates than Merseyside. Um, now, there's lots of reasons why that might be, and also, of course, that data is at a CRC level, and we haven't got the data for North Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. So what happens in Central Hull might be quite different to what happens in North Allerton. So, so we've got big, big gaps around our knowledge here. Definitely, and I think within that, when we compare ISOs and MAPA, that's the same, we're comparing the same, the, the like for like within forces. In relation to IOM, the selection of IOM cohorts in different forces varies from one force to another. So they may not have people who are suing for shops in there within So that's what the Ogre scores are supposed to deal well, with, aren't they? And I think and the data that Julie's referring to yeah. is the is the statistical yeah. data put yeah. out by the Ministry of Justice, which yeah. is in relation to yeah. cohorts managed by the CRC and MPS. Yeah. So not right. specific to yeah. our IOM data. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, okay. But 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 what that's what that's so what my my concern here is 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 our, our how sighted we are on our collective under the sort of partnership umbrella ability to manage offend, offenders. That's my big concern because we've got a we've got a gap of informa in the information from the CRC and NPS, and NPS for both of them. Um, and we've, we, we, we haven't necessarily got the data that we need locally either. So, so the concern here is whether or not we are, we are able to understand, really understand, what is going on with this cohort of, 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 of people. I um, you're very superficial. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't doubt that on a day-to-day -day basis that police officers and you know, the people that we've talked about in this, this, this presentation are doing their, jo their jobs. Don't, don't have any doubt about that, but what we can't see is actually really what the performance of this is across the partnership. What the impact on the yeah, is. Yeah. Because I think the day-to-day -day delivery on the ground by those officers who are dealing with the people within that cohort is effective, uh, and, and, and that's recorded within, within the, uh, the HIC report uh, and also within an audit report that we've got. But I think in terms of that higher level and understanding of it, of what's working and what we need to address in the future. So that is the challenge that we need to bring up. Yes, but I would also challenge actually the robustness of those effectiveness measures as well. 
because I don't think we necessarily got the data. Yeah, it's interesting because I've just reread the forward for the last joint inspection around this area by the HMI and the probation service HMI, where they basically said that intuitively this makes common sense. You would expect this approach to work. Um, and they use the language of being cautiously optimistic that it should. Um, but then they conclude that we think that the interrogated offender management approach has real potential. However, in the absence of robust evidence to support this, we cannot make a firm recommendation either way. So Somewhere it's really difficult to argue, is this working or not? Yeah. And whatever we can do locally to try and enhance that, that's one thing. But it's clear when you read this that it just feels like it should work, but it's not. And the interesting bit about the recidivism rates, although reoffending rates could be regarded as disappointing, um, we saw this as a symptomatically entrenched pattern of offending among the integrated offender management cohort, rather than as a failure of the approach itself which kind of doesn't make sense. No. It? <laughs> I mean, but there are some real, there, there's some real basics there. People need to deal with their substance misuse issues. They need a job and they need yeah. stable accommodation. Yeah. The relationships. Yeah. So uh, intuitively, uh, that's, that's absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But since that day, three years on, I don't think we're in a better position to know whether or not no. this approach actually is making a difference in the way no. that we thought it would. But, and it's not, it's not helped by the structures yeah. that we're having yeah. to deal with. But yeah. also those things that we all know are the trifecta of things yeah. that actually impact to be offended. They're, they're not in the gift of any of the three organisations yeah. with the responsibility yeah. for achieving movement. Yeah. So but I think that's yeah. the big challenge. In, in terms of the, the, this meeting in the you know, public accountability for some of this stuff, I don't think we've ever uh, um, allowed intuition to be, to be yeah. the answer. It would be a much shorter meeting, wouldn't it? Yeah. Some other areas. I mean, <laughs> for me, the issue is it, it's got to be exactly right. And, and, and what my questions would be maybe not necessarily fair to ask or answer here, mm. and will be to, to you as a professional police officer, what is the value of aggregated data that covers an area yeah. of, of that's so diverse as North Yorkshire and Poseidon yeah. and Lincolnshire? Yeah. It is a yeah. so I it is former, former Chief H of I, Dennis O'Connor, said that uh, uh, some time ago when he was in post to the public, even force level data yeah. is meaningless because it's yeah. too aggregated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are lots of individual studies where there's been um, a cohort specifically picked up and money provided by external providers to run a multi-agency, highly intensive programme for people coming out of prison of this nature. And the evaluation figures are there for that and it is exactly linked to getting them a, a house, getting them a job, but, but basically, basically taking those people to job interviews, to get their medical issues sorted out. It's a very intensive programme, and when you look at the return on investment, it's pathways questionable. For pathways, yeah. Yeah, it's pathways for offenders. Yeah. It's questionable in terms of the, the <laughs> sheer amount of, of investment required to get a cohort of people away from criminality. But it, 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 it depends what type of people you're talking Absolutely. about, though, doesn't it? The most, the most yeah. entrenched yeah. recidivists. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you would argue these studies have found it's just a disproportionate amount of resource and they will still reoffend because of their lifestyle choices. It's the people who you can divert away from criminality that it works for best. In Quite terms of some of them just need to be in prison. Well, the prisons are full, so <laughs> you know, something like But it's interesting because they, they come to, I love this, it's, um, it comes back to um, in the absence of robust evidence to support this, we cannot make a firm recommendation either way. But 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 what but, but what we've just accepted it. This is the way to go. But and what we, we but them. what but what we haven't got here in North Yorkshire is the data to to to, to, to make a determination. Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't we don't know. So th so so that's the challenge for the for the, for the team here. And it, and to be fair, it's the challenge that's been fed through the local mm. criminal justice mm. board is actually how do how do we get our hands on the data that we can get our hands on in order to try and make the best decisions mm. that we can in the context in which we're operating. Yeah. And, and if it isn't IOM, then why is it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can I come at, so having had the um, ability to get, get into your data a little bit further, it does look like the percentage of your cohort who are reoffending is decreasing over time, which is, I guess, positive news that we don't know whether they're the same people or yeah. anything like that. Um, but the percentage of them is decreasing. You said earlier that you fixed your cohort at 253 people. Do those, are those 253 people 
just for the benefit of the public, are they changing over time? So is, when we're looking at the data as well, when we're looking at the percentage coming down, is that the same 253 people moving through, or is that 253 people being dealt with, but those 253 people change over time? There's 253 people in the cohort. Right. So uh, if somebody went to prison for the first time, uh, and then they were coming out, they could actually be assessed and go onto that cohort. So that could increase over time. So that's where it is at the moment. Right. Okay, so it's not a static number, it's just trying to follow that cohort. Sure some will drop out, some will. Yes. So we haven't said that. So it's, it's never the same, it's no, never the same number, it's never the same people. No, it's not necessarily the same individuals in that 253. No, but the 253 could be 400 or mm. it could be yeah. 150. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But yes. Depending upon the risk assessments. Yes. 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 But what I'm saying is it, it's you're not always necessarily going to have exactly the no. same people. No. With no. That no. no. And, and that's what the challenge is in terms of actually that mm -hmm. cohort as it moves. We're not following a, a, an individual no. through their life cycle within yeah. the cohort, which would be really advantageous to be able to do that, to actually what work with that person, well, what, why, because there will be different factors for each person, uh, and that's what we need, need to understand. Mm -hmm. And that also might come down to geography, because what might happen <coughs> in a rural setting, and the support may be very different to what happens uh, within a city, sort of in a rural setting. A way, a way, if some back on Lisa's point, a way to assess capacity for change. So some people might just be built to be more flexible, and now they live the last, others won't be as flexible. So, I th so it's interesting, I mean, I, I when you talk to offenders and you talk to the offenders that, that, um, that ha have decided that to change, what you, what you tend, well, certainly what I've observed, and this is just my own personal observations, is that there, are, that there is something that's triggered that desire to change. So it might be a personal circumstance, it might be something has happened in their lives that means that they now feel that they need to change their behaviour. And so, and so I went, um, it was a, a drugs, a drugs programme in prison and essentially all of the offenders who'd successfully been through that programme had, had said, I, I, I realised that if I stayed in prison I'm never going to see my child grow up or my parents are about to die and I want to go out and I want to do this. Or so, There was something in their lives that had triggered that desire to change and it's, you know, for, and that's, I think quite um, um, well established in terms of um, uh, addiction therapies and all of the rest of it, isn't it? Is that is people have to want to make that change. So, so, so you really need to be able to offer something that is is bespoke to those people's circumstances, and that is the difficulty when you're measuring cohorts of people over uh, cohorts of people that do, isn't focused on individuals but it's just focused on data from a cohort and because it's actually it's an in, it, and we know from our coping recovery funds from victims and all of the rest of it that it is fundamentally a, a set of circumstances that an individual has in their lives so it's not to do with the interventions potentially it's just something happened outside of those interventions you can find the right but intervention can be individual at the right time impact, yeah. Yeah. but it yeah. has to be about Personal circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and then and then you can provide the support once people have sort of made those decisions to to to, 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 to help them, to support them in that choice. But it often needs that spark, of which then services need to be there at that time. Yeah. But something happens. Mm. Yeah. That resource that's able to actually but it's the same with pathways, it's the that same learning from pathways. Yeah. 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 Anyway. I'm, I'm conscious You're of sticking time. to time now, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, there is a, a slide on the multi-agency public protection arrangements. Uh, <coughs> in, in, I think uh, we've covered that. I think we've covered uh, <laughs> everything within those, uh, those discussions. I think the only part that I haven't covered in terms of the, the, uh, the, the mapper meetings that, uh, that we need, those additional support, support arrangements, I think in terms of the number of cases of some of the meetings that we deal with them on, that's probably about 17 individuals uh, in specific cases where we'll be bringing those arrangements together so we get that additional support whether or not it's through health, through housing, uh, through adult social care just to make sure that everything is in place. Uh, remaining with the map arrangements it is split around uh, those that have got a, uh, responsible, a statutory responsibility uh, which I mentioned earlier on around prisons and young offender institutes, police, national probation service, 
and those that have got a duty to cooperate uh, with children's social care, adults, uh, health, offending, youth offending teams, housing, job centres, uh, and where appropriate, the electronic monitoring providers. So if we need that additional support, we'll identify what the problems are, why it's coming to map it, which, which partner agencies are able to help us. They'll get invited and then we'll go through that and have a, a discussion about all the information, what's happening, what the issues are that we, that person may need the support with, what are the challenges and uh, how we can deliver that. Um, in the interest of time, could we move on to the next steps? Okay. Is that all right? Certainly, yeah, certainly no problem at all. So in, in terms of next steps, uh, in October of this year, we held a, uh, a regional multi-agency event, which was attended by police, probation, uh, CRC, uh, and there were some people from your office in terms of the OPCC came to that. And that was a, a presentation that was delivered by another force that had uh, basically explained the journey that they'd been on around the challenges <coughs> facing IOM, a new approach that they had followed, and that was the approach that had been presented to the National Police Chiefs Council IOM group, which outlined the balances around dealing with a traditional acquisitive crime uh, with the newer threat, harm and risk requirements. So actually I try to identify those people in the cohort, the IOM cohort, are they the people that we can work with, that we're going to have the greatest success with, and are those that are presenting the risks to the communities. Uh, that has been a good presentation, it promoted certainly a lot of conversation with uh, CRC and probation relation to that in terms of how we look at it. Uh, there was also a, uh, an independent audit that was completed last year, the results of that were published uh, late December. Uh, there are some key findings that have come out of that report which is in relation to uh, the the effectiveness of the uh, officers that were involved uh, on the day-to-day -day at the dealing with uh, offenders uh, and also some actions that we're looking at now to be able to move forward as a result of that report. Is that the IOM intent audit you talked about? Yes, which was completed by, uh, I said, it's in draft form. I think it's in draft form. Draft form. Draft form. Okay. Uh, as a result of that audit, we've commissioned a piece of work with the Forces Nexus team, which is, uh, which is looking at IOM, the, uh, the IOM cohort, and that's to identify how individuals within the existing cohort are being nominated for adoption. Uh, those individuals within the existing cohort, whether or not they're being uh, appropriately managed, whether or not they're continuing to meet the criteria for the scheme. Uh, and Consider people who need, need to be removed. So, so I think well. Nigel talked about this at the LCJB, didn't he? he did. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think there was quite a lot of concern from the partners around the table that, that we're not joining this up. So, um, and certainly the CRC was very keen to have a review of how the sort of cohort is identified and, uh, 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 and, and um, the, you know, deciding who goes in and who, do, who doesn't. Um, I, 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 I want to understand how um, the, the development of the performance management and accountability will work in the future because, because it, it moved out of Liam's and into, into safeguarding and I think we've lost that strategic overview of the function and certainly when we were looking, when, the, when, when Tim chaired the LCJB um, we were looking at actually where this should sit, weren't we? And 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 and, and I, I, I don't know whether that really has been determined. Okay, uh, I, I can answer that. Okay, in terms of so that's an action that we've got in, we've got in place around how the cohort is made up. Uh, I think it's important that to be able to take that forward is we've now got uh, structured meetings in place with National Probation Service and CRC uh, at the senior level to discuss the challenges that we've got, the challenges that they've got, to be able to tackle some of those exact issues around the performance data, what's been provided, and how we can understand That's it. within the context of the local criminal justice board, I assume? The, it's an additional meeting outside, so there's obviously the local criminal justice board uh, and our meeting. Right. I think it needs to come back via the structures of the LCJB. That's what I'm saying. Because, because I think what you're, you're ending up there with the very same partners that are sat around the table in the LCJB, LCJB, LCJB that go to Jenny's 
meeting, having working in parallel? No, it, it's not to set it outside of it. It's to complement it in terms of because we all go and turn the board that Jenny chairs, uh, which is right, and uh, that's got that oversight in terms of what we're doing. The meetings I've got with uh, NPS uh, and the CRC around actually moving and developing some of the issues that we've got uh, at an operational level and making sure that we're becoming more effective in terms of what we're trying to achieve. So would it be like appropriate for a, like a, an options paper or a... Yeah. A suggestion period yeah. of how they move forward to come yeah. either to BDNI yeah. or to LCJB, yeah. Yeah. and then I'm not sure how that feeds into NYP decision processes and CRC and NPS as well, because obviously I mean. LCJB yeah. could sign something off, but if it hasn't been signed off by NYP and CRC and NPS, but one would presume though that if it, it, yeah. yeah. Because we're not talking about work in North Yorkshire Police working in isolation, uh, we need to do it with CRC, we need to do it with probation, and we need to do that through that board because that's the appropriate structure to do that to be able to deliver about uh, with our justice partners. But, I mean, that I mean, the, the sense of coherence that needs to be developed, isn't there, between mm -hmm. the three statutory partners, but actually the people we need to get signed up to are the people that we talked about before, which is the housing. Yeah. Uh, who, who can actually offer the things that we believe actually makes a difference and but how do we get them around the table so 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 that links in with the community yes. safety partnerships as well yeah and the CSPs should be at the BDNI board because that's yeah. um, how we reshaped the yes. CJB so that the community safety partnerships were invited to the BDNI yeah. board so that they kind of exercise their duty around <coughs> <to> the agenda <coughs> yeah. um, we, with some success so we need to get better at making sure the right people around the table so that they can be put to the conversation. Because the, because the CSPs used to have an offending strand, didn't they, that came off came off them, but they don't anymore. I think it used to be a requirement that they exactly. reduced the offending board yeah. went to the CSP yeah, exactly. that reported and we just swapped that around yeah. and said, well, you come to our yeah. board, absorb the information and yeah. take that back to your board, please. It's, so I think what we need is some clarity around how all of this is, 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 is going to work. So that option, for Jenny, I think, will be a good idea. Okay. Yeah, cause, because also there's changes within the CSPs as well. Yes. So, and that's where we'll get those other partners engaging might not be ready for the next meeting because yeah. that's quite soon, soon but perhaps we could look at yeah. dates outside of this Alan and agree to yes, going no, forward. No, that's no problem uh, at all. Yeah. And then, and then if there's a if there's a sort of decision needed around, you know, PCC and Chief, then there are obviously other governance structures that we can use to facilitate that. We've now got five minutes for the rest of the agenda. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, welcome to your first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, Kirby Misperton then. So can I just, just for the ease of time, I think yeah. it's fair to say we're in maintenance mode, yeah. awaiting the decision from HM yeah. government in relation to whether or not the site can get signed off. Um, we're in maintenance mode, so everybody else. Yeah. Um, so that reflects in the figures. Um, there were no arrests in, in December, for example. Um, and I think there's been some. I think the easiest thing to do is we we are either on your website or jointly at the same time on the uh, Kingfisher website in relation to the answer to the questions. Yes. We can put that on there. Yes. Yes. That's no problem. Um, uh, just and we have written to the minister again. Um, um, trying to, f even if if they're not going to tell us, you know, what we're doing, but give us some sense of time scales. So we'll wait and see. Um, okay, so um, item six is the um, performance chart deck, rather. <coughs> Sorry, is that seven? Yeah, item seven. Sorry. So the Commissioner, there's quite a lot on there, um, given the time available, exactly. so there is a specific oh, areas you wish to uh, focus on, really, I suppose, that might be the best place to focus uh, Yes. So there's quite a lot of information there, and it will take quite a long time to go through it all. There's just one, Richard, it, uh, it, I, I don't know if you've been here for the various questions before that, but on the crime by district, 
I mean, sort of go back to Brady's point about this is this the maps. Is, yes, the maps, where it's disaggregated a bit, which is sort of helpful for, for um, residents of those areas. Yes. The same three districts are red again and again and again, I think, and there used to be a bit more um, clarity around why and what was being done, but again, they just sort of keep being red. And, and also, in addition, on the on the ASB slide, there is um, some annotation about um, what some of the writers have been linked to, but that same annotation doesn't appear on the crime slides. Yes, so, um, do you want to comment on those? Uh, yes, please. Okay, we'll start at the back then and work forward. So well, just, just on this... this yeah, I'll search your behaviour first then. No, um, it's we've got crime. 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 Not the ASB one I think is fine, it's the okay. crime one that I think... Well, it's not fine, but there's an explanation, whereas there isn't the crime one. Okay, so I suppose the one that stands out for me then is the Sarver District. Uh, which is, uh, there is some commentary there on the slide. Um, so, um, they have had a number of burglaries down in that area. Um, but they've put an operation together um, called Operation Dusk, uh, which is focused on a lot of cross border criminality, travelling criminals. Obviously, the Selby district is bordered by West Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, and Humberside. And being the previous commander down there, I know the history of the place and, and, and the impact that that has. So, um, there have been uh, f first of all reported burglars in the area, uh, you know, focused towards residential premises. Um, they are, have, have been talking to the commander down there, there is a focus around that at the moment. There have been a number of successes there in terms of arresting offenders and putting them before the courts. Um, and some of those um, <coughs> offences are, are attempts, whilst they're serious offences. Um, ten, ten of the offences were attempt offences, uh, and five of the accounts were linked to burglary, those, those are non weddings. So, so in, in totality, out of 34, uh, about half of them were, were towards houses. And that is an area of concern for us. Um, so there are, as, a, as I've outlined, a number of successes there in people being arrested. That are in front of me here, uh, and our you know our units, our uh, road policing units, and other units continue to focus on the borders. I just um, wonder, to Julia, I, not both per se, but often it's, it's these three districts over and over again. And, and Richard, there's, there's tends to be a response with a, an operation of some kind, which yeah. appears to be successful, or you know criminals are caught, or whatever. But they remain red for another reason, clearly, because otherwise. They, start coming down again or be amber or green so there's clearly a sort of um, long-term problem it looks like in those particular areas and it's just whether it's the same issues we've looked at before cross-border sorry rather than just because I think I understand that the local commanders are coming yeah at the next meeting perhaps that's something we, we can have a conversation there because I think we we're, we're using language which I think is needs some explanation because um, if you look back to some of the longer term trends, some of these areas have actually seen reduction. Um, Scarborough being the classic, Scarborough used to be the place for us. And I think it'd be useful to have a conversation with Al Day, for example, yes. about what's been done there, yeah. linked to things like the Community Safety Hall, etc. Et so it, it feels rather than kind of rushing it, no, maybe with the commanders coming next time. Well, I was going to say, because the different commanders come different pits, just if, if one small part of that might just have a look at those three together if there are any themes or anything, that was all I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, and, and what the, what the, what they're going to say, they will talk about the forced response to local problems as yeah. well, um, as well as just what yeah. the locals got to do. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have also, just, just to be aware, we've had quite a few representations from people in Selby recently, with concerns around sort of feelings of safety, um, quite a lot of it related to ASB and obviously there has been an issue in Coburn recently as well in Richmond in, 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 around ASB there as well and the, there's been a member of the public has contacted us in, in regard to that as well. So uh, so what we also start to pick up is, is when we start to see uh, uh, um, pressures, very often members of the public will come to us as well and say this is happening in our area. So you start to get a sort of convergence of a picture if you like then I'll go and have a surgery there and you'll get people coming in with a range of issues and the surgery will be busy because they've got concerns yes. yeah. you know so you start to sort of you know get a sense that 
that there's concerns in a community about certain things, and and that and we certainly are getting that from Selby at the moment, and 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 Coburn in particular. Those are the two areas where we've seen. I, I, I think in, in and actually Harrogate as well in some respects, but more again related to Lady as, as the tooth outline, when the commands come yeah. next time, uh, but just uh, as a, a note for re regarding Colburn, uh, Inspector Mark G, as you know, yeah. is, is the local uh, inspector. Yeah. There's a problem solving plan there, yeah. multi agencies, yeah. and there are lots of people yeah. involved. And it's focused particularly on the shops area. Yes. Uh, there's been a large public meeting that the police yeah. facilitated with people, yeah. the local authority looking at the number of interventions, yeah. along with other parts as well. So. So we are actively working with others on this, and it is of concern, yes, for, for the members of the community. But just to give that reassurance that North Yorkshire Police are, are doing their bit, as it were. Oh, I'm not saying that you, you, you're not. Work towards um, it. And coincidentally, um, uh, I think you yourself attended the, the launch of the Police Cadet Scheme that we just launched at um, the school there uh, at uh, Common, which I think is a good plus, really, in terms of the statement of intent from North Yorkshire Police uh, uh, and what we're doing. Um, there was one, if I may, just comment on, because I don't want to get lost in, in, in all the performance. Um, the members of the public will have seen over the Christmas period the drink driving campaign that we undertook. Uh, and, and actually, the, the results of that are quite stark. Um, so, for the 27 campaign, 130 drivers were arrested uh, across the region uh, for that offence, which is exactly the same as last year. Uh, there are some quite startling examples there of people akin to very excessive levels. Um, they've been put before the court and so on. But it's just I wanted to make you aware, which I think you might be aware already, of, of the significant issue that that's, uh, yeah. it presents uh, amongst yeah. communities. Yeah, we yeah. are. Um, just, sorry, just on the, the Selby um, issues as well, Sherman in particular, I have had some really good feedback from the PTSO who's down there now. There had been some changes in, in yeah. the team down there. People were feeling that They'd sort of lost that connection with the police, and we, I've had some really positive uh, comment back from the police so who now, that, you know, from the team in Sherman now. So that that's good. But I still think there are issues around the ASB in Sherman at, at the moment, and I know there's a lot of work going going on and and, and all of the rest of it. But there there are. <coughs> Yeah, and I think one of the things is the danger of going on the red, amber, green kind yeah. of sort of performance matrix because this is very still very sort of crime focused. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of the work that I've previously touched on that I know Mark Bates and Nexus has done around demand. So we are in a position now to actually tell the public how much time we're spending <coughs> on social behaviour, for example, in different force, parts of the force area. So again, it's kind of what's short term issues that may be of concern. And what's the more longitudinal stuff that clearly we need to work with other partners around kind of uh, reducing some of the demands on policing. Um, and I think there's an opportunity before the new performance year to kind of just revisit yeah. that. So missing from homes is a classic. I'm not sure the public understand the sheer amount of budget and resourcing that goes into missing from homes. Because yeah. whilst they're doing that, they're not doing some of the sort of stuff. So just trying to create you know, a, a broader picture for people. I mean, I think once that work is... Um is in a state of readiness. It'd be interesting to bring that here so people can sort of understand it. Yeah. yeah. So I think Mark's been. And it's also that. sorry. It was also a key part of the HMIC recommendations as well. Yeah. So it would be good to see how we're responding to to that. And I think Chris, you've seen some embryonic work we've done around mental health, yeah. for example. Yeah. You know, uh, and the demand that the police yeah. on police have, um, yeah. which has been developed for us. We've all already suggested that we invest some crucial money around missing from homes yeah. next financial year. Yeah. So no one understands the data that we're yeah, partly yeah. relation to that. It's trying to work on the evidence, isn't it? And Absolutely. we know now how much time, effort, and energy is going into it. And some of it is we're kind of filling the gaps for the people, which we shouldn't be doing. But we need the evidence yeah. out of the debate and discussion. Okay. Um, so, so thank you. Um, then, item seven is the 101 force control update. Um, there has been quite a lot of communication around this actually prior to this meeting, so we've just picked up on the sort of. Yeah, I, I think the headline figure for me, uh, we had a goal meeting on on this uh, last week that the deputy constable chairs to give that reassurance of that grip around uh, the force control room. Um, there's a raft of figures in the pack. Uh, it's an improving situation. Yeah. We've put a lot of interventions in there. Um, you know, and that ranges from a physical person doing a switchboard function, 
to a Q-Buster facility where coal, coals can be called back. Um, to you know, getting more people through the door in terms of staffing the phones um, and the other functions that are going on. We've split the Crown Recurrence Management System, so that's an admin type function away from the call handling process and that's in, in a pilot phase so we need to look at how successful that's been. Um, of course you'll have heard previously at these meetings about the volume and the increase in calls that have come through. Um, you know, that, that's still sort of present. I think the good news story is that probably at previous meetings you've spoken about the length of time that people calling 999 have had to wait. Well that now is much improved. Um, there's the odd one, whereas before it was quite regular. Um, so it's a much improved position, and I can sit and go through all the stats with you. But so uh, no, I mean I think I think what this this says is that um, there have been, you know, we had got some serious issues that a lot of work has been done and starting to improve. I mean, obviously, you know, cool, the the volume has come down yeah. uh, uh, in comparison to the peak, um, and the question is is whether or not these measures will deal with the demand if it increases again, and that's the big question. Um, um, uh, uh, so that's what we need to work on next. Which we will do, we will look at a more sustainable yeah, plan yeah. moving forward. Yeah. Um, now things are stabilised. Yeah. And this will keep coming back until that sort of summer period where we know what, yeah. the, what these improvements have meant. And what yeah. do. Okay, all right. So, um, Will, do you want to just go through the forward planner? Yeah. So next time around, we've got the local policing um, elements. We haven't quite done it. Well, it's for the chief to decide, I suppose, but we haven't quite decided how that was going to be presented, whether the local commanders would come or not. So that's, I think, to be confirmed. But um, I thought we'd agree that it would. Oh, fantastic. Great. I they've been, they've, sorry, just fantastic. for clarity, yeah. the, the three commanders have been invited to, right. to the, the meeting. Um, it makes sense, I suppose, that given it's about local policing and they can talk about what activity they would take right. locally. So uh, we're going to, as always, but, but this one's probably slightly easier um, to explain to the public and get the public involved in local councils, for example. So hopefully we'll, we'll put a lot of effort to that. Um, and sorry, just for clarity, I think you know, in the Peace and Crime Plan, that there's a section within the Peace and Crime Plan that co talks about local priorities yeah. and the nice map of it. Yes. And that's one of the areas that the commanders will focus on, yeah. uh, talking about what activity they're undertaking, but also what the force response is to support some of those local things. That's right, so there's two elements to it. There's, there's for example, how are, uh, how's the commander of Scarborough looking at the drugs issue in Scarborough, but equally for cross-border crime that might that might be present um, <coughs> in Craven as much as in Selby, there'll be an element of how does the force respond to cross-border crime and things like ASDR. <coughs> so it won't just be local solutions, local problems. There are force-wide issues that are being dealt with that manifest those issues. There'll be sort of two elements. Yeah, and it's so the public understand that you know the local commander can tap into force resources or regional resources or even national resources yeah. so when and if the requirements are. I, I think that's important because I think very often people just think, oh, it's just my local neighbourhood yeah, team that deals with things, and it's yeah. people really understanding the sort of breadth of service that the police can offer when it's yeah. needed. So that's what we hope to, to do at the next meeting. After that is, is Digital, so that there's a lot of chain around policing and digital services at the moment, nation, again, nationally, regionally, and locally. So it's an understanding of that and how North Wiltshire Police are um, readying themselves for that and the changes that are being implemented or about to be implemented. So, mobile working, for example. Um, and then discussions um, after that for future meetings, but um, uh, there, are, there are a few things on our agenda, stopping harassment, everyone. so we'll, we're yet to decide those, and we will do um, by the end of. Yeah, crime recording at some point as well. So, um, yeah. Okay. And then demand is the other one. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's great. Um, questions. Do we need to be reading out, Sam, or can the members of the public? Uh, no, we can that? broadcast that as well. Right. Yeah. So we just broadcast that. Yeah. Thanks. So, Dave, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I am aware that there's um, obviously we would apply normal kind of measures that Alan's taking an inordinate amount of time to explain <laughs> to people. But there is local arrangements with Rydale District Council, for example, around the sort of um, sanitary conditions, 
any issues of concern at the, um, I think it's two sites now that we have um, protesters. Um, my plea would be if somebody can back up that comment, then they need to contact us and we will look at it. Um, and I will take it back to uh, ACC Oliver just to sort of reassure myself that um, if there's any kind of substance to that comment. Yeah, I mean, and Alan, you just um, described how anybody who uh, is on the registered sex offender would be flagged on the systems that you've got and all of the rest of it. So all of those standard procedures that you have in place for dealing with those people would apply whether it, whether, wherever they happen to be in our county. But that's right. If that's something that's travelled to it, would, yeah. uh, and the big yeah. stop check where the police would understand yeah. a why they're there, we would be sharing that with their offender manager. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whether that's PPO, which you would yeah. expect in those circumstances. Yeah. Uh, well, so we, we have some due diligence that. on the. <coughs> so not going to react to the kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlotte. Just uh, another slide on this. Oh, quickly. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Just to remind everybody that um, the uh, consultation for the precept is out at the moment. Uh, please do go to www.telljulia.com to have your say about um, the police funding uh, that comes from your council tax for the next year. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thank you.